There have always been many miracle cures marketed with little scientific foundation. Many of these cures are products that have been around for years and have been eliminated as potential medical treatments because of the risk of toxicity. Every now and then something that was used years ago resurfaces and sometimes they might be a better or safer option than allopathic medicine but not always. Today's miracle cure is not different. With the corruption in the medical system, I don't know if there's been a time more ripe for fraudulent medical claims. The very reason that the FDA was established was to prevent snake oil salesmen selling products that were neither safe nor effective. So we must never forget what it was like before the The Food and Drug Act was passed and critically assess all information available about a substance. I rely on you to tell me what is being hawked in today's online communities and I am always happy to take a look and give you my opinion. I know that some of you are concerned and I wanted to give you a quick update. I was painting my stairs at about 1 a.m. on Thursday night because I had a friend coming to stay with us. I was stupid. I was trying to reach downward to a lower step that I had missed without stepping on ones that were still wet and I reached too far downward and went tumbling down about 14 steps. I was in severe pain near my lower right ribs, but I knew that even if I broke a rib, there's nothing you can do but stay put and let it heal itself. My concern in that area was my liver and my bowels. It took a few days but no signs of jaundice and after several days things started moving inside and today I've got just a little tenderness so I'm still taking it easy, but glad to say that I'm out of the woods and can't wait to get back with you guys full time. Thank you so much for your concern and just know that I am always going to rely on nature to heal my body, and so far it's done well by me, so there was no emergency room or unnatural treatment and I'm gonna be just fine. Okay, so I apologize for the delay, but I have a great question that I was working on before the fall by at Patricia Sideri, 3,817 and today's topic is chlorine dioxide. First, don't forget to like the video for the algorithms. Subscribe to find my channel and ring the bell to be notified of new video drops. If you want to support the channel expenses, please take a look at some of the hand-picked items under the shop button and of course I am also so grateful for super thanks tips under the three dots below the video. So let's look at the question that prompted this video by at Patricia Sideri 3817 and I do apologize for my delay in getting to this question. What are your thoughts regarding chlorine dioxide? The first thing that came to mind on this was that people spend a fortune for home water purifying systems and chlorine is one of the main contaminants that they are removing from our water supply. So I thought I'd first take a look at that. Hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ion are added to city water as a disinfectant and monochloramine. Dichloramine and trichloramine are all formed when chlorine reacts with ammonia, which is toxic to varying degrees depending on which chloramine that we are talking about. Monochloramine has a low toxicity and is used intentionally in water treatment at 2 to 4 milligrams per liter to kill bacteria. The EPA says this is a safe level. Dichloramine and trichloramine are more toxic irritants to eyes, lungs, and skin at higher levels over 0.5 milligrams per liter. Trichloramine and CL3 smells bad like pool chlorine and can harm. It's rare in water treatment and is explosive and highly toxic in gas form. The subject chloride of chlorine dioxide, ClO2, is used as a disinfectant in some public water systems. About 5% of large U.S. facilities serving over 100,000 people use it to kill bacteria, viruses, and parasites in drinking water. It's an alternative to chlorine which is less prone to forming trihalomethanes, which are suspected carcinogens. The EPA sets a maximum of 0.8 milligrams per liter 
or 0.8 parts per million in drinking water, which is effective for disinfection without toxicity. Who echoes this limit? At this dose, it's been used for decades without known widespread harm as millions drink it daily. High doses above 10 mg per liter can irritate eyes, throat, and lungs if inhaled, or damage red blood cells and the GI tract if ingested. Unregulated use, such as the Miracle Mineral Solution, is actually at 100 to 200 mg per liter and can cause severe vomiting, liver failure, or death according to a 2019 FDA warning. So let's see what they are talking about. Just as isopropyl alcohol kills many pathogens, so does chlorine dioxide, but that doesn't mean that you should ingest it. Even in small amounts, chronic exposure to chlorine dioxide can cause serious health issues due to its oxidative nature. Now I'm sure that there is a lot of bad medicine being disseminated, so let's look at the facts. And then if there are allegations that I didn't cover, you can leave a comment and we can discuss further. Chlorine dioxide is ClO2 and is a yellowish-green gas with a pungent odor, widely recognized for its potent antimicrobial properties. Chemically, it's a strong oxidant, meaning it can strip electrons from other molecules, making it effective at killing bacteria, viruses, fungi, and some parasites. It's been used since the early 1900s industrially in water purification, paper bleaching, and sterilizing medical equipment. It's tightly controlled, applied in tiny safe doses, and not ingested beyond trace amounts in treated water. In alternative health, though, chlorine dioxide has taken a wild detour. Proponents tout it as a cure-all, claiming it can treat everything from cancer and autism to COVID-19 and malaria. The most infamous product is Miracle Mineral Solution, or MMS, which was popularized by Jim Humble in the 2000s. MMS involves mixing sodium chloride, NaClO2, with an acid, like citric acid, to generate chlorine dioxide, which users dilute in water and drink or apply. Humble's pitch started with a 1996 anecdote about curing malaria in South America. Of course, this is unverified, but it went viral in alt-health circles. Today, groups like the Genesis 2 Church and Figures on X push it for detox, pathogen killing, and even cancer remission, citing personal testimonies over science. But does it work? Oral ingestion. MMS protocols suggest a few drops daily in water, claiming it oxygenates the body and wipes out pathogens. X posts in 2024 and 2025 hype it for lupus, multiple sclerosis, and cancer, often paired with DMSO or vitamins. There are no studies that I could find on these applications. As mouthwash sprays, Low-dose solutions of 0.01 to 0.8% are used for bad breath or gum health. Some studies back this in the Journal of Drugs in Dermatology. However, patients were told not to swallow the solution. It has been topically applied for skin issues such as eczema and nail fungus. Evidence is anecdotal and it is not FDA approved for skin conditions. Chlorine dioxide spiked in popularity after COVID. During the pandemic, Peru saw an 8 to 16% prevalence for prevention and treatment, despite no concrete evidence. The FDA and CDC warned that chlorine dioxide is dangerous to ingest and has been falsely marketed as a miracle cure. The EPA sets strict limits for chlorine dioxide in drinking water due to toxicity risks. The World Health Organization recognizes its disinfectant properties but warns against human ingestion. So we must remember that just because something kills germs doesn't mean that it should be used for the body. Again, my first criteria is, did it come from a plant or naturally occurring health practice? 
Another thing that came to mind to research was why would anyone push an oxidant for healing when natural healthcare constantly reinforces that we should have foods high in antioxidants? First, advocates like Jim Humble argue that oxidants kill pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites by oxidizing their cell walls or proteins, which they do according to 2022 Healthy Alternative Uses. The idea is to flood the body with an oxidant to cleanse diseases such as cancer, autism, and malaria. And here's the thing. It does kill lots of pathogens, in vitro. There's lots of data on it. However, there are concerns that relate to use in humans. A treatment must target pathogens without harming human cells. Oxidants don't discriminate. So the next concern is dosing and does it ever get to the pathogens in human beings? I did come up with some studies that I can refer you to. First, there is one human study which indicates that at a concentration of 24 milligrams per liter, there was no short-term damage. The study in a 1982 Environmental Health Perspectives publication by Lubbers et al gave 10 healthy men ClO2 in drinking water at escalating doses 0.1 mg per liter to 24 mg per liter over weeks. This one small study of 10 humans identified no significant changes such as hemolysis, liver damage, or kidney issues at a dose up to 24 mg per liter. Blood ClO2 levels stayed low suggesting quick metabolism or excretion. You will note that these doses were at the levels found in drinking water and far below MMS claims of 100 to 200 milligrams per liter, where pathogen killings peaked. But even if such a small study at low doses didn't reveal damage over months, there are other considerations because these doses were not studied in humans for whether they killed pathogens at that strength or not. To get a better feel for toxicity, numerous tests have been done on rats and it appears that blood dyscrasia and respiratory issues are a concern. This extensive report by the HHS Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry will be linked in the description for your review. There is a third study that we should consider which was not in humans but it was done in mammalian cells. This is not a safety study, but a bioavailability or efficacy study. A 2013 study that will also be linked explored the antimicrobial action of ClO2, suggesting it's size selective. In a laboratory, ClO2 rapidly killed micron-sized pathogens, such as bacteria and fungi, by penetrating their thin membranes. Unfortunately, its penetration into larger, multicellular tissues such as human tissue was limited. They used protein membranes such as gelatin and pig bladder to show that ClO2 diffusion is much slower in thicker structures, implying circulation in humans might further protect cells. So let's talk about why we keep hearing about taking antioxidants to counteract oxidative stress. Oxidants such as ClO2 and free radicals steal electrons from cells, producing reactive oxygen species or ROS. Cell damage due to oxidative stress causes membranes to rupture lipids, causing cells to leak and die. Also, breaks or mutations in DNA increases cancer risks. Proteins misfold and malfunction, causing enzymes to fail. Various tissues are also affected, such as hemolysis in the blood, where red blood cells burst with ClO2 at 100 mg per liter. The liver and kidneys can suffer inflammation and failure as oxidized cells pile up. The lungs and gut can experience irritation or ulcers due to direct oxidant contact. Lastly, chronic effects of oxidants on the body are accelerated aging, arthritis, and neurodegeneration as oxidants fuel wear and tear on the body. So in conclusion, the key to safety is the dose taken, but the size selectivity idea in human models shows that ClO2 zaps small pathogens fast, but it struggles with deeper human tissue penetration. 
human circulation might dilute it further. There are literally no controlled studies in humans. Void of such testing, oxidants like ClO2 could still harm delicate cells, such as the gut lining or blood cells if systemic. In general, oxidants are very harmful to the body, accelerating aging. The American Association of Poison Control Centers, AAPCC, and the National Poison Data System, NPDS, have reported cases of TLO2 exposure involving Miracle Mineral Solution from 55 U.S. poison centers between January 1, 2000 to March 31, 2020, which isn't a whole lot of cases, but they do give us a little more insight. The most frequently reported side effects were vomiting, nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. In a nutshell, it looks like ClO2 is safe at 24 mg per liter and unsafe at 100 mg per liter, but we have no idea at what dose toxicity can become a risk. We also have no idea if a dose of 24 mg per liter is even strong enough to kill human pathogens. If it were, then normal drinking water could contain that much. Also, we know that studies appear to show that simulated human cells are much thicker than micron-sized pathogens, and ClO2 appears to have difficulty penetrating thicker mammalian tissue. So that's what we know, guys. The exact toxic level isn't known, but we know it's less than 100 mg per liter. ClO2 doesn't even look like it can penetrate human cells. Mammalian cells and tissues might limit the reach of ClO2, so we can't even prove that it works in human cells. Killing pathogens such as COVID on a dish isn't the body, and the chlorine dioxide must reach pathogens without breaking down or harming nearby cells. Chloride dioxide doesn't know pathogens from human cells, so it oxidizes anything vulnerable. Human cells can resist damage via increased antioxidant intake, but high doses still cause hemolysis and gut damage, so chlorine dioxide will not be in my medical toolkit. I hope this answers beautiful Patricia's question. I also added a link to an article by McGill University entitled, Miracle Mineral Solution is a Nightmare for Your Review. I'm still recuperating, so bear with me, guys. I'll be up to speed shortly because I miss you guys so much. Until next time, remember this quote by Dr. Andrew Weil. The body wants to heal, we just need to stop getting in its way.